Well, good afternoon, everybody. Seems like we had a color matching over there. <laughs> this is not a dress code or anything. Um, well, today I'd like to talk about mobility, mobility and innovation. Um, I don't know if I fit in this cultural section in the afternoon, but I try to speak culturally <laughs> as much as I can. Let's see how this thing works. Uh, let me start my presentation by making this rather bold statement saying that the uh, auto industry or auto manufacturing is the industry of the past and it is losing its momentum. Well, <laughs> saying that, I mean, hearing that from a Ferrari designer or whatever, or pickup uh, truck uh, owner, whatever, might be a little shocking to you, but uh, you know at the bottom of your heart, somewhat, it's coming, or it is true right now. Um, a lot of that is because of the uh, hardware focus of car manufacturing, which is completely skipped the designing the infrastructure. I mean, can you imagine doing the same thing in the computer industry? Just leaving the, uh, the internet infrastructure completely to some other industry or somebody else and just selling hardware. Can you imagine Apple doing that and being successful? But in auto industry, that's been a common sense. It just doesn't make sense at all, but it's been happening. But it's coming to the end, unfortunately. Um, another thing that the, uh, uh, it's been quite tough in designing automobile is that uh, in about uh, 20 to 30 years ago, when I used to work for General Motors, there were about 35,000 people working in a lab, and all the product planners like, or designers like us used to have to go to the lab once in a while asking this uh, Mr. M of James Bond or whoever, uh, if there's anything cool happening, and this M will show me something cool. Hey, Ken, we have something cool going on. Say, like, wow, that's great. Why don't we put that into the product? And maybe it's going to sell well. In fact, it used to be the way we were designing any products in uh, any industrial design field up until this point. But unfortunately, we don't have time and money and people to do that anymore. Those days are gone. So what we have to do is to, we have to pinpoint from the beginning that we want to have this technology to make this product in five years. It's going to continue selling for the next 15 years. You need to have that vision up in the front. But that's new way of developing automobiles or products or anything. It's almost like uh, it used to be a shoot and aim. Now it is really aim and shoot. We came to that point, finally. Uh, I won't get into details. I just wanted to point out just one thing, that if you look at the middle point, manufacturer says that when automobile was a brand product, Manufacturers used to have a lot of profit and a power in industry, but now it became more of a commodity. When products become commodity, now the power is shifted toward the retailer. Why is Yamada Denki have so much power to have its own products? Because they have information directly coming from the uh, customers and apply that back to the manufacturer. That's what's been happening. Unfortunately, auto industry didn't realize that it became commodity many years ago. And that became tragedy. So when the automobile became a, a commodity, then what happened is that the rival of car is not a car anymore. It's an aircraft, it's a train, it's an internet, it's other means of transportation or information that you're fighting for, I'm fighting against. Um, how this uh, transportation is influencing how you formulate the city. Let me just take you, uh, uh, show you some examples of my hometown. It's called Yamagata City. Uh, it's my hometown. And it's known for um, planting rice and apples, um, apple fields and rice fields and so on and so on. And it used to carry up until 1800s all the rice to uh, old capital of Kyoto City. And the, uh, at that time, they're taking boats all the way from uh, Kyoto taking the Japan Sea to the Sakata City, taking the, uh, the Mogami River up until Yonezawa. So the, uh, the cities were formulated around the river. What happened after the Industrial Revolution is that the train system were purchased from the uh, UK and they applied all over the, uh, the country, and Yamagata was an exception. So they ignored all the rivers, and now the train system became the core means of transportation. And therefore, the station became the core 
of any uh, city structure at all. Then what happened after that, after World War II, then automobile became a, a means of personal transportation. Personal transportation for the first time, that became main core means of transportation in Japan. Therefore, the city of uh, all the uh, cities used to be uh, quite big along the other stations and railroads, and now it's along all the, all the roads. Still the way it is, all this together, what you see is what's going to be happening in the future. People ask me, Mr. Okuyama, is, is this electric vehicle or hybrid? The answer is, it really doesn't matter. If you talk about EV or hybrid or um, diesel engine with the turbo uh, whatever, you're talking about how you're going to provide your services of transportation to public. But what really matters is what sort of service you want to provide to public. What transportation, what mobility you want to give to people. That's what matters the more. To explain, to give you an answer to that question, let me take you to field trip to Middle East, in the country of UAE. Uh, instead of Abu Dhabi, they uh, started developing this city called Mazdar a few years ago. They're going to complete this construction by 2013. And we're lucky enough to participate in this program. And this image was created by uh, master architect uh, Norman Foster. And the, uh, what's noticeable is about 50 years ago, there wasn't any oil. Now this one of the richest countries in the world is investing heavily into the future technology and the people to build this city of rather small, it's actually 90,000 people during the day. And the, uh, it's carbon free. When you think about it, one of the richest OPEC country investing heavily into the future energy technology. And completely carbon free. It's something that should happen in Japan, but it's not happening at all. But it's happening in California to a certain extent, New Mexico, and here, Abu Dhabi, and Qatar, as we speak. Um, this image is created by uh, master designer <laughs> Ken Okoyama's uh, staff. <laughs> and you might notice that, yeah, we are car designers, but car designers no longer design just cars anymore. You really have to design a total environment, total city, and total infrastructure, and total product, the whole thing. It's a package deal. Without doing that, the story doesn't carry through. And you really have to do the drawings or renderings, whatever we call, to explain about how this is going to be um, uh, built. We call this Da Vinci Project because we're collaborating with the Italian government and the, some of the universities in Italy. We call this Da Vinci because um, if Leonardo Da Vinci were to design an automobile right now, he would never design the way it is right now because they're missing the huge part of it, like I said, infrastructure and application, operational part of it, and parking, city congestion, how do you solve all these problems? And we wanted to give part of that answer by proposing some of the solutions to, to the city. A um, company called the Better Place is also working on this battery exchange program, and uh, also other people working on it too, uh, besides us. That uh, Battery exchange, for example, is necessary when the range is rather short, but it's more of an entering solution. When the technology gets advanced enough, that it, it will be actually long enough that it's more of a um, what sort of service you're providing to people. It's not how or by using what battery, it's more secondary. <coughs> this is also uh, um, another view of the, the station uh, here. That uh, image is rather dark. I don't know if you see uh, something at the bottom, but the, the, this uh, lithium-ion battery comes up from the bottom, and the, uh, the change that you only need about two uh, minutes. Instead of recharging in about uh, 20 minutes to sometimes eight hours to charge in regular time, that this way you get the full charge in two, two minutes. Um, it's, you know, there are pros and cons about changing the, uh, the physically changing the, the battery uh, unit itself. But that's one of the solutions that we're looking into. As it says here, now, we're preparing for non-ownership society. Battery is not going to be owned by people who purchase those cars. But if you're looking for service of mobility, why do you have to buy those 
Because after all, it's kind of dark here. Hope you can understand what's happening. What it is is actually it's a future uh, Starbucks. <laughs> and a Starbucks with the, uh, some uh, uh, recharging station and a battery exchange station here. It's not the other way around. It's not that you go to the gasoline stand and buy coffee as you do now. No, it's going to be totally the other way around. As you remember that the first chart that you saw, more power and influence is given to the retailer and the people who have actual access to people. Those are the people who buy coffee. Those are the people who buy, I mean, who sell those products to people. Those are the places that you actually go as a secondary purpose to recharge your EV or something. And that way, you get the actually best location and the uh, better services as a total package of services. This is also another picture of the Starbucks station in Abu Dhabi. That it's not uh, built yet. <coughs> but as I said, there's definitely this power shift of manufacturer to the service provider. Just like cell phone, anybody who lives in Japan now, uh, you won't talk about who makes these uh, cell phones, but uh, who is the uh, main uh, service company of your cell phone is more influential. It's the same thing. It's coming up to, uh, to automobile, too. Maybe this is not well, working. Um, so um, you might be asking, Ken, is the world going to be full of commodity and boring products and nothing you really want to spend your money on? Now, the definition of maybe brand product is something you want to buy. Commodity product is something you have to buy. Brand products or luxury product that you want to buy, you just simply don't see enough of them nowadays because um, we, designers, just don't make enough of those products appealing enough to public. You want to make people to spend more money. You want people to keep those products for a long time. Just like when I buy those Swiss watches, <laughs> I don't need them. I have cell phone and all over the world, and nowadays you can see those uh, clocks and whatever tells you what time it is. I buy watches not to see time, but to see watches. And watches, when you think about it, you keep them for a long time. I probably, you know, I have a collection of about 20 watches or something. Every time I go home, I just rewind them. Oh, my daughter laughs at me. But, uh, <coughs> excuse me, but uh, those watches, it's going to stay with me. And I probably give those to my sons and daughters and friends. And it's going to last forever. It actually makes your life more luxurious and fun than what it is. In fact, that's what makes human different from monkey. Oh, didn't explain about this uh, luxury limousine. Uh, the uh, one great thing about uh, electric vehicle is that those uh, electric components are not connected mechanically to each other, so that uh, you can mount those motors and the uh, conductors and the, uh, all these components at any locations you want, and simply hook them up with wire. That gives you much more room and freedom to package the entire car. So how about the supercar limousine, for example, something like this? That gives you much better performance than any other uh, diesel or gasoline engine cars or limousine that you can imagine. I would actually, uh, if I were Leonardo, not Da Vinci, but DiCaprio, <laughs> uh, driving something like this, an Oscar presentation, red carpet, for example, would make a good, you know, the, uh, the presence. And also, actually, there is uh, certainly room for uh, designing something interesting, yet commodity products don't have to be all boring when you think about it either. The right side image is actually the, uh, uh, imagine your apartment complex, and the body side, you take this little uh, capsule commuter and the, uh, that takes you from uh, you know, home to work, but when you come back home, it climbs up with its own motor on the side of the building, and it parks on the side, and actually becomes your parking space and also audio uh, room, outside of the room, so you can listen to Michael Jackson with a full blast, uh, whatever you want to, and in the morning, it takes you back to the road, and, and the uh, automatically guided or not, it just takes you to work or school. Uh, it could be something like this, but could not be done 
by auto manufacturers by themselves, as you know by now already. So it happens throughout this uh, collaboration with other people in industry. Uh, all the things I just talked about today, I want to repeat, but I just want to add one more element to something that makes your society and the uh, mobility uh, better than today, which is the uh, chain reaction dreams. I'm just give you my personal experience that I decided to become a car designer when I saw this one show car back in 1970 in Osaka Expo. It's called Modulo, which was designed by one Italian designer who was heavily influenced by Apollo 11 that he saw a year before that, 1969 July, if you remember that date, which was also, as you know, guided by famous speech by JFK back in 1962. Well, in 1962, they newly formulated NASA hired a whole bunch of college graduates at the age of 21. At the average age of 28, of those scientists and engineers designed, engineered those Apollo 11, sent a man to the moon. And by watching that, this Italian designer designed this one supercar, which influenced myself as well. That convinced me to be a car designer in the future. So that is a chain reaction dreams that when you think about people in Roppongi or wherever, or Daiba, on the road, they're watching those cars passing by, there is no respect in it. I want those kids to respect those automobiles and this industry of transportation. It will happen because I have a dream, <laughs> sounds like somebody else, <laughs> that there's still room for good commodity, and also excellent brand products to provide better innovation and mobility. So my question to you is, what is your dream? And what are you doing every day to make it happen? That's my question. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. <laughs>